I'm the shit flick critic. G'day everyone, it's me, Andrew Lewis, with another travel story for you all. Uh, I had a pretty good reception the last time I did one, uh, so I thought I'd do another, and uh, how the duck review is up, so um, if you haven't seen that yet, please see it. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Um, and I should be starting my next review sometime this week. Uh, but with all that being said, let's jump into it. So uh, this story will be about the time that I stayed at a homeless shelter in Sydney, in Cape Breton, in Nova Scotia. Uh, I was in a town called Edmonston in New Brunswick, and I was trying to hitchhike out of there to Nova... I, all I knew was that I wanted to be in Nova Scotia. I didn't really know where. Um, I was stuck there for about probably six hours or something like that, just uh, on the side of the road with my thumb out. And I noticed with hitchhiking, there's this kind of weird thing that happens where the longer you wait, the longer the ride will be that you'll get. Because I know that when I was in Ontario, I waited 10 hours for a ride and then I got a 10 hour ride. So I remember sitting there thinking, okay, yes, you're waiting for a while, but you will get a good ride, you know, so just be patient. So lo and behold, a car pulls over and it's this Sikh dude. And uh, he says that he's going to Cape Breton in Nova Scotia, which I'd never heard of before. And he said, it's a 10 hour ride away. And I was like, well, there you go. So I got in and um, yeah, we did a really, really good ride. Um, he told me all about the Sikh religion, which I had really not a lot of idea about. I knew that they wore turbans, but that was about it. Yeah, he broke down for me the history and the history of India and where, where India is at now. It was a really, really good ride. And I remember as we were leaving um, New Brunswick to go into Nova Scotia, it was like late afternoon and it was golden. And the golden light was hitting all the maple trees and all the different trees of different colors. You know, the pinks, reds, oranges, yellows, and the whole skyline was just carpeted in these colors. And it was just, just beautiful. And then nighttime hit. And uh, by the time we got to Sydney in Cape Breton, it was probably about three o'clock in the morning. Uh, I remember he dropped me off. And at that point, I was just sleeping in bushes. That was, you know, how I covered costs. And uh, I actually enjoyed it. But the problem with Cape Breton was there wasn't really a lot of trees or anything. So I ended up sleeping at an abandoned railway line, which were, if just a bit of a tip, they're, they're really good places to uh, camp because... No one generally goes walking down them or anything. Uh, you get a bit of privacy and there's always little spots like there's trees and there's little spots for you uh, to camp. I picked a spot which was right by what I thought was also an abandoned work yard. But unfortunately for me, I woke up at about eight o'clock in the morning to hear like people talking in trucks. And I stuck my head out the tent and there was like chicken wire fence and then all these dudes and they could see me because I, I was in this bright green tent. They could see me camping by the rail yard, so I just kind of gave them a wave. They didn't really seem to care. Um, so I packed up, and the whole reason why he took me there, this, this Sikh dude, was because I said that I was a musician, and I was a street musician. And he said, well, he's like, uh, Sydney has all the cruise ships come, filled with Americans. And boy, did it ever. I remember busking, and I made so much money, because not only did I make it an American, yeah, then I transferred it over to Canadian and it was significantly more so I think I ended up making about $110 a day it always seemed to be in Canadian but the problem was is I had nowhere to stay there was nowhere for, good for me to camp and I remember someone saying to me that if I was ever in a spot where I had nowhere to be or like a uh, accommodation wise look into a homeless shelter so I looked up homeless shelters in the area and I saw one that was nearby so I just went there um, just packed up all my stuff and started traversing across Sydney to this place. And I remember crossing a road and, I, and a lady almost hit me with her car um, because there was, no, there was no real pedestrian crossing at these traffic lights um, and there was no pedestrian lights, you know, like the little man. So I was just standing at these lights and, you know, the way that I was going went green. So I thought, oh, great, you know, I'll go now because the traffic's going this way. Uh, but this lady started turning as I was walking and she hit her brakes and I could just see her go. Um, it wasn't close, but it was enough to make me kind of freak out a little bit. And then she drove away and I kept going. So I walked all the way up this hill 
and then I, uh, there was a little buzzer, I buzzed it, and they were very perplexed at who I was and what I was doing there at first. Because they're like, who is it? And I was like, uh, my name's Andrew, I'm just an Australian backpacker slash hitch- hitchhiker. I uh, just need someone to stay for the night. And uh, they were surprisingly okay with me staying there. I was very honest with them. I just said, look, I'm not home. Well, I guess I am kind of, but I'm not, you know, destitute. I just need somewhere to stay right now in Sydney. There's no hostels. There's nowhere with a roof for me to stay in. And from that point onwards, I learned very quickly that being in a homeless shelter isn't like being in a hostel. And I don't. I know it sounds obvious, but even then, there's just so many things you have to do. Uh, you have to empty your pockets when you go in. Uh, you have to say every time you leave, you have to say where you're going, uh, how long you expect to be gone. They lock all your things up in a cage because everyone there, you know, is either using drugs or wants to use drugs. So there's a high chance that they'll steal your things. So I had to put my guitar and my backpack in this cage. Um. So, and it was okay at first because it was a bit of novelty. I was like, all right, well, this is this is new. I've never done this before. And there weren't just either homeless people or people addicted to drugs there. Some people were just in between houses. They'd been evicted from their accommodation and they were just looking for somewhere else to stay. And I remember a lot of them seemed to be men in their like late 50s, early 60s. And they were a little bit insecure about the fact that they were there. Because I remember this one guy, like the Nova Scotian accent is a bit like the um, the Newfie accent. It's almost Irish. And I remember sitting down on this chair in the lounge room and there's this old guy next to me. And he's like, oh yeah, you know, so where, where are you from there? Hey, you got, you got an accent there, hey? I said, I'm, I'm from Australia. He's like, oh yeah, oh, Australia, oh, okay. You know, no, I'm not homeless. No, no, no. No, I'm just uh, waiting on some roof to stay. Like, just, just just trying to find a place to live. I was like, okay. I didn't didn't ask, but it's like, okay. I could just tell that maybe he thought I was secretly judging him for being there, but it's like, hey man, I'm here too. So, you know, it's not like I'm any better off than you. Um, yeah, and then the rest of the people there, you could just tell some people were just really, really needing a fix of their preferred drug. You know, people rocking back and forth and um, scratching their faces and uh, a lot of them just didn't talk. Some people talked too much and then some people just didn't talk at all. And the longer I stay there, the more I really felt it's starting to suck all the energy out of me. Again, because at first there was this novelty of like, oh, this this is kind of kooky. And then after about a day of like um, just constantly telling them where I'm going to be, I had to ask them to get my guitar and they would kind of dicks about getting it for me like they weren't always like because sometimes they'd be talking to one another the people running the shelter and i'm like waiting and i'm like oh excuse me um could i just get my guitar they're like yeah yeah in a bit it's like okay i just just want my guitar so you know the way that i was being spoken to i was being spoken to like i was homeless which was very degrading and um i can't imagine what it must be like if you're actually homeless to be spoken to like that uh the other kind of the other thing too is I was making so much money during the day that I kind of felt a bit guilty coming back and there's all these people who are destitute and there I am with a hundred bucks fresh dollar notes in my pocket from busking um and I remember this one guy there uh, I forgot what his name was I think it was Greg I just felt so sorry for him because he was obviously really really struggling with alcohol and I just quit at that point so I, I got it I knew exactly where he was at and every time he came into the uh, shelter, he'd just have different um, marks on him from hurting himself while b- being too drunk. You know, like a, one night he came in, he had blood all over his foot. He stepped on some glass. I'm pretty sure it was him that was vomiting every night, which was really hard for me because I was trying to go to sleep and it, it could have been him or it could have been someone maybe um, withdrawing from heroin or something. But, you know, you're trying to drift off into sleep and you can just hear just vomiting. Uh, But, yeah, this one guy, I had had some money and he came up to me and he he really needed money. And he said, um, he's like, oh, I've got a uh, got a sleeping bag. Uh, Can can you give me like thirty dollars for it? 
I'm like, man, I'm really sorry, but I, I have a sleeping bag. Um, and it's pretty good. It's like, you know, for, um, for zero degrees. And I could just see the disappointment in his face. It's like, oh, okay, thanks. And as he was walking away, I just went, I opened up my wallet and I had two fresh $20 notes. And I just went up to him. I said, hey. And I just put him in the palm of his hand. I was like, just take it. He's like, no, no, I'll, I'll give you the sleeping bag. I was like, just, just take it. I, you need it way more than I do right now. And um, the poor guy, he, he ended up getting kicked out because he got into a fight with one of the people that worked there. And uh, and because they wouldn't let him in when he was drunk, so he had to stay outside. Or if he did come in, he was highly abusive. So he ended up getting kicked out one day. Um, and as he was leaving, he just dumped the sleeping bag in my, in my lap. He's like, just take it, man. He's like, you know, you paid for it. I was like, okay, I'll find something to do with it. I ended up just giving it to the homeless shelter because I thought, um, you know, I just said to him, I said, look, if someone needs this, give it to them if they're, you know, homeless and blah, blah. And, uh, yeah, I remember, so I was there probably for about three or four days and it really started getting to me after a while. I started getting extremely depressed, um, it started raining as well. So I couldn't hitchhike out of Sydney and I couldn't busk. So I started just kind of living there as a homeless person, which was started really upsetting me. Um, and I remember, uh, they'd close for like three hours a day sometimes and they'd kick you out for three hours. And it's like, what am I going to do for three hours in Sydney while it's raining? So I just go to like an A&W and just sit and have like five coffees because I just didn't know what else to do. Um, and I was trying to get to this fort that was nearby, but I just couldn't, there was no buses and, um, I was trying to hitchhike out there, but I didn't know what the traffic was going to be like. Yeah. And I just felt really stuck in this place because it was just either raining or trying to work out to get this fort, but couldn't. And in the end, I just knew I had to go because I really, really started feeling bad. Um, so I just decided, I went up to him. I said, okay, that's enough. I think I'm going to leave Sydney. Uh, packed up all my stuff and left. And it just felt so liberating. I was just uh, like, just a weight off my shoulders to be out of that place. And uh, as I was leaving, the guy who I gave the $40 to, he came up, he's like, do you still have my sleeping bag? I'm sleeping in a bush. I need it. I was like, I'm sorry, man. I gave it to the, to the shelter. He's like, but I can't go back in. They've, they've banned me. I'm like, well, I can't go back in either. And in retrospect, I should have gone back and gotten it for him. But I was, you know, I literally just left and I just wanted to get the freak out of Sydney. Um, so I did feel kind of bad, but I hope he's okay now. I just feel really sorry for him. You know, he's telling me that he has parents that just don't talk to him. And, you know, I the good thing about that experience was seeing that kind of lifestyle and knowing that a lot of people, a lot of people think homeless people are homeless by choice or they're just lazy or, you know, they've had their chance, but it's like no one wants to live like that. No one would choose to live like that, to be spoken to like I was being spoken to, to, you know, to just always feel like you're subhuman. And that's how it felt after a while. You just stopped feeling normal or like a person. Um, yeah, so I really, my heart goes out to all those people. And some of them might still be there. I don't know. And it's just this vicious cycle. I just don't know if any of them are ever going to get out of it. And that one guy, I just saw so much of myself in him when I was really struggling with alcohol. I mean, the difference with me was, you know, I've got parents that would, you know, if shit really hit the fan, they'd give me money. But he doesn't. His parents don't talk to him, so he's just stuck. And even that last day when I saw him, he was drunk. And uh, I remember when I left, I got a ride straight away. It was great. I got like five rides almost immediately. And I got to Halifax and I felt so good. Just to be around no people, normal people, people my own age and travelers. And I went and stayed at a hostel and I just felt my little batteries recharging like I was a human being again. Like no one was going to ask me to empty my pockets or... Um, yeah, so... It just really upsets me that that's people's life. And that some of them will never know anything else. They'll never get out of that pit. Uh, I Fortunately for me, I was able to. And um, that's why now whenever I see a homeless person, I always give them like five bucks or something. 
because I just know what it's like to not feel human. And when someone does one nice thing for you, it's just this feeling of like, oh, I feel like a person again. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's that story. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Sorry, it's a bit of a downer, but that's what happened. Uh, so I'm going to start my um, my longer review this week. Um, if you did enjoy that, please like, uh, please subscribe. Uh, did I just say subscribe? Yes, subscribe. And um, yeah, that's the end of that story. So thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you in the next review.